You know, I do a lot of these things. And I call them these things because I do it over and over again. But this is so unique because I'm from a little town called St. Stephen's, right down the road a piece. And my first course at NYU was a course called Field Trips to Museum and Art Galleries. And I went to all the great galleries, uh, Castelli, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I never dreamed in my wildest imagination that I would come up the road 40 miles, see some things that looked exactly like I saw in New York. So this is really a fabulous kind of place to be in now. And I applaud the people who are involved with that. And I applaud you two for being here. I have an amen corner here. There's my wife back there. Her name is Rosa. And there's Miss Frances Thomas. I taught her as a sophomore. Now she has her granddaughter with her who's holding up that iPad. And her daughter, a granddaughter there, she's got a granddaughter in there too, so it tells you just how long it's been for me. Well, as I said, thank you for coming. And what I want to do is talk with you about what I do. I do not paint with paint. I do not paint with acrylics or anything like that. I paint with dyes. I started with Batik at the Art Institute of Chicago, and Batik is a process of putting wax and dyes on fabric. When you put the wax on, the wax saves the space, you dip it, and that color has to dry before you put more wax on, you save that color, and you do it over and over and over again until you complete the work, and then you take the wax off. I take the wax off with with an iron. My wife, incidentally, is the person who takes the wax off. So she's, in the, she's involved in the process with me. The thing about that, though, is sometimes I'll work on a painting for a month, get all this wax on, takes two issues of the state newspaper Sunday edition to get it all off. And when she takes it off, she says, let's keep this one. And over the years, that's how I've made my, built my collection, the things that she keeps. The reason I don't iron it off, I know you say you're a male show and you don't iron. The reason I don't is because after you work on something for a month and you iron it off and you start, and then you iron, you say, oh, I should have done this. Mm, I should have done that. Mm. It's just too agonizing. What I brought along are some silk pieces that I did. And I'll have these so that you can look at them. But these are little, this, this is done in silk. I don't work in silk. I work in cotton because cotton holds the dye and uh, you get a, a brighter color. Also, that after I do that, then I mount it on a board and then work on it some more with dyes and wax. Sometimes I use crayons, sometimes I use markers. But the whole technique of working with batik, batik traditionally is what this is. It's making a decorative all over pattern. Uh, and if you notice, in order to, these, you see little cracks in it. The little cracks come from when you put the wax on, you crush it in your hands like that, and, the, and you dip it in the dye solution, and the dye seeps into the cracks. And when it seeps into the cracks, that gives you a crackle effect. So it has a kind of aging quality about it. What I tried to do with my experiments is to control the crackles so that if I wanted something to look old in a particular spot, it would look that way so that if I did a face, I could change the expression of that face by crackling it. It's time consuming, consuming and a work that's, um, the average work takes about two weeks to do. Now most people say, two weeks to do, that's a long time to do a work, because everybody now wants to get things done quickly. But to me, it forces you to think about what you're doing. As an artist, you need to think about what you're doing. Now, when I think about art, one of the things that is most important to me is that art is not what you do. Art is the way you do what you do. You really need to remember that. Everybody can do, for instance, the way Michael Jordan plays basketball is an art. Because of what he does and what he can do that is not regular, the regular basketball thing. So art is not what you do, it's the way you do what you do. The other thing is, the most important thing is that art 
is to capture the essence of things. That's what it, its intent to do, is to capture the essence of things. Not necessarily to be something that, that, um, that, that when, you, when you see it, 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 everything is said, or everything is told, it leaves spots so that the view, you can insert things, whether it's writing. Now, he, there's a poem that uh, 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 an American poet wrote, his name is uh, Amir Baraka, Don Lee was his name before he changed it. But you know, we're coming into the graduation season now. When you come into the graduation season, all the graduation speakers have the same thing. They say the same thing. You telling students, you are the leaders of tomorrow. You need to make sure you don't just sit around and not do your work because the world will need you tomorrow. And if you do, you will set a whole generation back. Here's the way a poet just put those same words into a capsule and set it beautifully and with economy, because I think good art has economy. This is what he said. And he was from the ghetto area, so he had to communicate to folks down there. This is how he said it. Brother standing on the corner. He think he cool. Winter comes. Brother still standing on the corner. He cool. And you see, notice how, notice how that takes a while to drift in. But when it drifts in, you understand that that's exactly what these speakers with all these degrees, that's probably what Gates will be saying when he speaks to the Uni University of South Carolina. That's my hometown. That railroad track that runs right down here, it runs right through my hometown. Go all the way to Charleston. My hometown, unlike Lake City, hasn't changed very much since then. This is the theater where I worked growing up. Right there. That's that theater. That's the booth where I was a projectionist. I was at 15 years old, became a projectionist there. Um, I became a projectionist because the white projectionist quit. Because he wanted more money, and he paid me less money, and I became a projectionist there. I used to look out of this window and look down at people on this railroad track going north, up there where Lake City is, down that railroad track. So I saw the town from a different perspective. I also saw all the movies and all the movie town news. So in my day, I saw a lot of things that I would not have seen had I not been a projectionist. One of the things that happened to me that I remember that you will see in some of the paintings is that when I came down from the booth where here and came down here where they sold popcorn, it was segregated, black people sat up here, white people went down there. When I came down, uh, there were high school kids there who did play around. And uh, one was some white girl selling popcorn. They said, hey, Leo, how you doing? My mom was always scared that if, if they kept on doing that, that these guys who, was at, who were in school with them would do something to me because I had to walk home at night. I had to go through this very dark alley, at the dark patch of ground where there was no lights. And I turned the corner and see a light in my mom's house. She always stayed up for me. And I had to face that every night. Amazing thing is that I had a book signing back at my hometown. The girl came in there and she said, you remember me? I said, no, I don't remember, I don't think so. Her hair was white. The person I knew had dark hair. That was a long time ago. She said, I was one of the persons who sold that popcorn back there. I used to kid around with you. I said, you could have gotten me killed. She said, I remember. <laughs> I said, I, she said, I remember touching you, and I could feel you tense up like that. I said, you notice that I stopped coming down there to get popcorn. That's how I survived. I have this book now. Anyway, this is my mom and my dad. My mom was from Mississippi. He died in the 50s. My mother uh, lived until a few years ago. Uh, this, 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 here they are as a young couple. And this is my mother later on and my grandmother. They became almost like sisters. You can see the resemblance. The reason I'm showing you this is because as you look at my paintings, you'll see these people showing up in my work. This is my uncle, and this is me at six years old. Now this uncle, his uncle Silas, didn't take no mess. Uncle Sila had some land, and when he went downtown, they knew he had land, and because he had land, they didn't bother him too much. And I remember sometimes I'd be walking 
the theater and walking down this really dark place, and I'd see this man coming toward me with a John Wayne walk. And he wouldn't, he would just, my, my father had passed, and so, you know, my, I have five brothers and a sister, so I'd be coming home at night through that dog, and I'd see him, I'd get scared, and he'd say, hey, and I'd say, hey, and he wouldn't stop, he'd just walk right on past. Sometimes he'd come by the house, he'd say, hey, he, just, he was a protector. I shall never forget him. He was my grandmother's brother. And this is the house where I grew up, which is still there. They say they want to save it as a memorial, but they're not giving me any money to do that yet. And this is my grandmother later on, and one of the first paintings I had published under cover of the Crisis magazine. Now, it was, uh, when, I, when it was published, my grandmother saw it, she said, son, that don't look like me. I said, Grandma, it's not you. It's, I'm trying to capture the essence of you. She said, what did that mean? And that was another conversation. But I think what I got from it is the floral pattern that she has here. And of course, uh, what I did with this is, to get this, I simply took hot wax and splattered it on there and then uh, put uh, the dye on it and, put, and colored the dye and the fan. So this is what you see with Batiste. This is what you see with the splattering and this is what you see with the small crackle effects there. And so on, this is later on, but again, here is the pattern, and here you see the crackle effects that you see down here. One of the things that I started doing very early on is juxtaposing old age with, with youth, because I think all the people have this wisdom, and so my whole idea was to contrast, juxtapose, this wisdom of old age and youth. And one of the things, you remember I just told you about that poem? One of the things about, about art, I think, is a simplicity. How do you take, take everything away and have the least common denominator there and still suggest what it is? There's no question that this person is old, so you don't have to put faces and stuff in there. You, I think when you do that, you insult the integrity of your viewer. And so what I do is I create that by maybe the shoulders, maybe the hat. And here, with the, there's a little girl here. You don't have to put eyes and noses and mouths in it. And the same thing here. You simply don't have to do that. I didn't have to put faces in here. You realize that this is a matronly figure. And so one of the things I tried to do early was to simplify my images, was to economize that hat that my grandmother wore. And this is a painting from the, from the uh, targeted series where I did the targets. And here I have a rooster. Now, one of the things that Hale Woodruff said to me at NYU that I shall never forget, he said, we African-Americans should get our symbols that rep from our culture, just like in the, in, in, uh, the Guernica, um, Picasso did bulls and horses to represent. He said, we do it in our blues. He said, we do it in our spirituals. He said, but we don't do it in our visual arts. And he says, we need to try to do that. I always remember that. So I looked at growing up and found out some things. For instance, I know that roosters rule the barnyard. A rooster is in charge. So sometimes when I have roosters in my work, it's kind of a symbol of that authority image. And there's something about a rooster when he goes around doing like that. You notice that? You know, I'm in charge. And so I, I've used that rooster every now and then. This, of course, is called Evening of the Rooster. Uh, this is a close-up of, I put this in because you remember that hat my dad had on? My father passed away very early. I was about 15 when it happened. And so I didn't get to know him as well because he worked on a, a job where he was gone all day and, and early in the morning. And then the mother, uh, uh, my mother was here and we had five brothers. I have five brothers and a sister, so they are all, all of them down here. But my, my father had a green pinstripe suit that I remember. And I didn't remember so much about him, so I suspect that's why the vagueness is there. But again, you see the crackles that create that kind of antiquing effect. You just call it antiquing. I say it's aging, because I think all of us go there. And I see in my batiks a way of, of suggesting the passage of time. This is Blue Wall, one of the early paintings that I did. And I remember when I had this painting exhibited at Francis Marion University, 
A little lady came up to me and said, Dr. Twiggs, I love those little children that you do. She said, but why do they look so lonely and so, so uh, uh, underfed and undernourished? I said, well, I see kids like that all the time. I said, back when I was driving up to this show, I saw them. She says, I didn't see them. I said, you really need to look again. I think that sometimes the problem that we African Americans have is that when we do paintings about African Americans, uh, people want to see jolly kids. It's, it's sweet, it's nice, and they like to think of, of it that these kids are just, they might be poor, but they're happy and everything else. That's not the real case the way it is. If you notice, both of these figures are looking in different directions, that you don't see all of them, that there is a loneliness about them. In fact, when this work was exhibited at uh, the University of North Carolina, somebody wrote an article and said something about there's a seeming loneliness, seeming loneliness. And I suspect the way it is, because of what inspired this were two boys who were our best friends, but their parents were not as strict as our parents were, and they really ended up not going to school. One of them got killed, went to jail, and they were lost boys. And I just came to know them as somebody who were our friends growing up, but who did not really make it. And this, of course, is Nightbird, and I called it Nightbird because when I was growing up, there was a small room on the back, and we had a window like this. And I would look through that window, all my brothers and sisters would probably be asleep, and I'd look through the window and see a bird flying, and I'd wonder what that bird saw from where it was. What was going on? How did, how did the world look from that place where, where that bird was? And I suspect it because I was at that theater and looking down there, I wasn't as high as that bird could have been. But I always thought about that. And I, you know, you, I think one of the things that you have to have is mem imagination. Every artist must use his memory and imagination to do what he does. Then I went to the University of Georgia uh, in 1967. Uh, the, the way I got there was they wanted to integrate. And so they came to uh, South Carolina State and said, who wants to go? And of course, they, they were paying my way, so my wife sat down and we agreed. She didn't tell me until later that she was scared all the time, but I went to the University of Georgia, and I remember going to the University of Georgia, I'd go through these towns like Washington and all of that, and what's amazing is they had these Confederate flags out, as if the war was still going on. Sometimes I'd look in my rear view mirror and you'd think the Confederate troops would be marching behind me, because there were so many Confederate flags, much more than anything I saw at, uh, in, in South Carolina. And so I did this series called Commemoration, and if you notice, there's all the crackles here. What I did was, the reason I got all these crackles is that I put this in the free, freezer. I got busy and couldn't get back to it. And when I dipped it, I got all of these crackles, this real aging thing. And then, of course, the flag down here was that. When this was exhibited, what really struck me was the, it, it won the top prize in the show. And the, the juror wrote me and said he wanted to see some more of my work. I mean, I still feel that right now, you know, for a Jew to say that, that he saw something in the work. This is a commemoration, and if you notice, as I've been talking, that I tend to work in series. First, the series that you saw here with the mother image, and now the commemoration. And the reason for that is that I, I had a day job. I was a professor, I ran a museum, ran the art department, and still I painted. And I had to paint after hours. And because I paint after hours, I'd paint and then go and come back. And it was easy for me to paint one picture and then another picture in the same series to keep it as if, at least get back into it as I, as I went. And so that's what I did. Now, when I started those flags, what happened, it brought me face to face with some of my own past. My grandmother told me a story about her mother, who was about 13 or 14 when freedom came. And she said that she, her, her, her mother died in childbirth. And so she was raised by servants in the master's household. And I, that always struck me. She said that when her father finally, after this freedom came, came over to look for her and said, uh, Missy, I come to pick you up. And she said, you're not my daddy. He said, uh, the, 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 the buzzard laid me and the sun hatched me. You ain't my daddy. 
Somebody had to tell her that. It, it just struck me, and so I thought, what would Sarah look like? And so I did this piece using a dolly, and I tried to figure out what would she play with as a little girl, because she had no mother, she was being raised by somebody else. And, 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 and when I did this picture, I called Sarah Remembered. The Gibbs Museum brought the painting, and I suspect that my grandmother came, mother, great-grandmother, parents, ancestors came into Charleston. And many people who come to Charleston, I have gotten letters from all over the country, people who see this and write and ask me what motivated it and all of that. Then I have a son who likes to look at uh, our past and found a man named Pansabitas who my grandmother said that this, this my great-grandmother worked in the household, was one of the servants in his household. And this whole house, this house is just about a quarter of a mile from where I was born, the house I showed you before. Well, you know, that's what they said. I said, if she was taking care of the master's children in that, there must be a balcony in here. But we could never go into this church. This church is 1758. I had a show across the street from this church. The woman said, you want to look inside? I went inside and looked around. It's small. And so I didn't see a balcony. Then I saw some curtains up there. I said, oh, what's that? She said, that's a balcony up there. And there was a stairway. And I went up there, and I stood in that place where my great-grandmother must have stood. It was, for me, a wrenching experience. This is called Free. And this also was also inspired by this business of looking at that whole commemoration series. Uh, during the Middle Passage, uh, uh, many African Americans, uh, at time Africans who were brought to the country, when they were sick or when they died, they were just thrown overboard. They were just thrown overboard for shocks and everything. And I remember when I was doing this, I, I just got so taken and I was putting this, 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 this thing on the race, this iron on, the, on, the, on this hand, and there was nothing there. And then I, I saw, I made out what looked like an F. And then it just, I simply just took that and developed it, and then that became free. And then I thought that from the depths of these people who sacrificed their lives being thrown overboard, we rose. The, these were the people, the ones who survived that, became our ancestors. Michael uh, 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 Angelo wrote a, a, a poem about that, and still I rise. But it's about that part of our, uh, our, uh, our culture. And then I began to do flags. As, uh, first, I, you noticed the ones with the images on. And then afterward, I decided, what would if I do without the images? This path flag is, is almost about uh, uh, three by four. That's as large as I can work. But I want to give you a close-up of this so that you can see. When, when I do flags, I, you know, the flag is, uh, is an image that many white people want to forget, many black people want to forget, many white people want to remember. And one of the things that I think of it as, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a thing from the past. What has happened here is all of that is gone with the wind. So my flags are flags that if you were to open a trunk and your ancestor fought in the war and you picked it up, what would this flag look like? And so this is what I tried to do is show this flag, this thing that might be deteriorating in your hands, this thing that is old and aged, this thing that ought to be an heirloom that you should keep, but you shouldn't be flying it on top of a state house or anything of that sort. And so I've also taken and changed the color of the flag. What happens if the flag is not the same color as we know it? Will it have the same power? Does the red, white, and blue have more power than that? In the South, we plant cotton. And so I call this cotton flag because it has that, that connotation. This flag is owned by the Greenville Museum. Museums, I think Gibbs has one. Most of the flags are purchased by museums. Herbert F. Johnson Museum and, um, and, and Cornell. Uh, this is a piece uh, that also came out of that whole genre. This is called Rooster Ritual. You remember I said about that rooster? 
that rooster who had that head who was big shot? Well, that's rooster that is not such a big shot anymore. That rooster is being caught. And uh, you know, all these people don't have on just the white case. I don't think you have to say all of that. This, is, this, is, this piece is on by another artist you probably know, Jonathan Green. Uh, Blues at the Beach is another one of the series that I did. And, and this came about uh, because we have a, we have a timeshare in, in Merrill Beach, and so we'd go down there to it. And, and it's in North Merrill Beach, so if you come downtown Merrill Beach, you ride down King's Highway, and there's Barefoot Landing. And then you go on further down Barefoot Landing, and there's Atlantic Beach. Atlantic Beach was the old black beach, the only place where black people could go. That's not the case anymore. But what's amazing is that on both sides of, of, of Atlantic Beach, it's all grown up, it's beautiful, and Atlantic Beach is that slither of place that has not developed. It looks the same way it did in the 1950s. But here's what caught me. You could go by Barefoot Landing, go in by the Alabama Theater, and then go to a place called the House of Blues. And when you go to the place, the House of Blues, you can buy $7 uh, 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 hot dogs, and you could see old houses where they have painted up like Disney does. You know, take these old houses and make them look like old blues band houses. And that's the House of Blues. And when you look at that, you see the real House of Blues down, just right up a, 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 a mile and a half, and you see the real House of Blues. But nobody ever sees the real House of Blues, because they stop by the House of Blues and pay $7 for that hot dog, and they think they've seen it all. Well, this is called duet. No explanation needed. I always think of the blues as being bittersweet. Bittersweet, not bad, not good, but somewhere in between. This is at the, the College of Charleston has this piece. It's called Moonlight and High Cotton. Another one of those icons is that image right there. Now, that's a bull image. The other image that you will probably see in my work is a cow. And a cow and a bull are different things. A cow is a very docile kind of creature. A bull is a very aggressive creature. And so here you see where I tried to use these symbols. You see them in my work. One of the most interesting things, though, is that coming by a cotton field, I remember I had my grandchildren in there, and they said, Granddaddy, it's, that's snow. I said, no, it's not snow. I said, that's cotton. So to make sure that they got a feeling of it, my wife and I took them out and had them pick some cotton. But um, I often thought a cotton field, you know, if you can use that as a stage, you can use the cotton field as a stage to say all kinds of things. So I use the cotton field as a stage here, and here's that cow I talked about. Here's that figure. Here's that little house in the corner. Here are the stereotypes. Here's the man. Here is somebody walking away, slipping into darkness. You know what that means. And then there's the flag, and then there's the guys singing about all this stuff. And if you listen to B.B. King, that's what they sing about. They sing about those blues. And so I try to suggest that in this called High Cotton Down Home Blues. Kevin, a fellow from Merle Beach, has that. Uh, I don't know, Kevin is from Alabama someplace. And this is called The Birth of the Blues. And in this, what I did was have the central panel. I mean, you remember I told you about my mom waiting up for me every night? When I grew up and had kids, I used to wait up for them every night. And now I really felt that, you know, if they go out, you, you worry about whether they have an accident. If I went out, my mom whether, whether, uh, wondered whether or not I would come home alive because you could just disappear. And I thought that very early on in the days of segregation, when that happened, that was the beginning of the real blues, when all those mothers, Emmett Till mother, never saw him again. And so all of the, that's where blues started. And so I put this here as the frightened kids out there, as the mother cradling it, and then the disciples who delivered this feeling about the blues. This is called the blues for B.B. Here's a close-up of that. This is called the blues for John Lee. John Lee is the uh, John Lee Hooker. And this is called the blues for Bessie. This developed over about five years. First it was... B.B., and then it was John Lee, and then it was Bessie. 
Well, another series was the hurricane. Hurricane series came in 1989. This is, this is, this is just one of them. I'm, I did 11 paintings. And I did them because one summer I just didn't have enough time to do, go with different paintings. And I started one and went to another, went to 11 paintings. The paintings went to a gallery. And a man in Greenville named Jack Shaw bought the whole series. The first time that had ever happened to me. I took the money and built me a studio, and I call it the studio that Jack built. <laughs> this is another one of those. This is the one, this is uh, called uh, Phillips Gate. If you're Philip Simmons from Charleston, somebody said that Phillips Gates were so beautiful and airy that the hurricane didn't touch it. And that's true, the hurricane didn't destroy one of Phillips, uh, Phillips uh, 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 Gates. And this is, of course, it happened in Charles, and this is called Door, and this is a close-up where you see. Now, you know, you can't see the wind, so I had to suggest the wind. I had to suggest. You can, so here, this is done by something that I have here. Let me show you what that's done with, with hot wax. It's done with something called a jaunting tool, where I put hot wax in it, and then that wax comes out of this thing that looks like this. And so I could draw with that, draw the lines with that, called the jaunting tool. Another series is Targeted Man. I have one of those over here. And Targeted Man, uh, it, it's so timely, because when I was growing up, the Ku Klux Klan used to target blacks. They'd come and march around uh, so that you get intimidated. Uh, they'd start doing all these kinds of things. And so I thought, you know, that's what was the terrorism back then. Nobody talked about it. That's what it was. But then 9-11 came. And then everybody started feeling like we felt when the Ku Klux Klan came in our neighborhoods. And what's amazing about it is when we, we don't know who they are. We don't know how they look. They're always, mis they could look like us. We don't know. They emerge out of places. They are shadowy, but we are targeted. And you know what just happened in Boston? Nobody knew. They, were, they looked just like everybody else. And that's the scary part of it. Every time we relax, something like that could happen. So this series is called Targeted Man. Sometimes it could be somebody with a hood. Sometimes it could be somebody coming, and who knows when it could be nuclear. But the thing about it all is that they are anonymous, shadowy figures that moves among us that creates fear. Uh, I call this landscape with two cows, because here in South Carolina, we have this ambivalence about the federal government. You know, sometimes we like them, sometimes we hate them more often than not. It depends on who the president is, who the president is, and whether we hate them. In any case, our flag, our state flag, looks a little like that. And so I've seen bonds with stripes on it. So yeah, I put some stars out there, and so here we have this kind of interrelationship between South Carolina and the federal government and two cows. You figure that out. I don't even know what it is myself. <laughs> uh, Another series, of course, is uh, spirituals, religion. We African Americans go to church. Like, for instance, when my students came here, I called that my amen corner. Everybody should have an amen corner. And so the Ezekiel's Wheels is one of, the, one of my religious paintings. This is on by the Bank of America. And this is just one in a series uh, that I call Ezekiel's Wheels. Another series is Silent Crossing. Crossing, notice that this looks a lot like the Confederate flag. Do you know that if you look at a railroad crossing and you take off railroad crossing, it would be just like the, the crossing in the stars and bars of American flag. So sometimes I transition from one motif to another motif, from one symbol to another symbol, but what caught me about crossings is that we have to cross over the whole idea, the whole things we feel about the Confederate flag. We have to cross over that. But in life, life is a series of crossings. 
I mean, we, we, we lose our loved one. That's a cross that we have to get over. We fall in and out of love. That's a cross that we have to get over. And I really, it really came to a head when I went to church to one of my uh, colleagues who, in the end, had passed, and the minister said, Barbara has made the final crossing. Because once we die, we make that final crossing. But we go through life making these crosses, coming to them, weathering it, and getting over it. And so, and sometimes we get over it silently. We don't tell people how we feel. We just grin and bear it until we get over it. And so, this is silent crossing number five. Well, you know, aside from doing the paintings, I also did some other things. One of the nice things that I remember is this is the Benny Mayer's house. I used to ride by this going to University of Georgia, and when I rode by it, it was side the road, and there was a marker that says the Benny Mayer's house, and Benny Mayer's, this was a tenant farmer's house, so Benny Mayer's parents didn't own the house, and so I was asked uh, by the White House to do an ornament, and they wanted an ornament of historic buildings. Well, a lot of folk did historic buildings of those great buildings in Charleston and things like that. What I picked to do was the Benny Mayer's house. Well, they wanted it to be white, and the Benny Mayer's house is not white. So I made it white, and then I went over it and rubbed some stuff in it so it didn't look so white. But it became an ornament, and what's amazing is this house has hay in it, it was falling down, and once I did the ornament and brought attention to it, Cliburn got with the, with the um, the Nicholson, who was the mayor of Greenwood, and asked the woman for the house, and the woman didn't want to, I mean, she remembered what happened with her folks with Benny Mays, and she said, I don't want any publicity, you have to move it under, uh, uh, and I don't want to hear anything. So one Sunday, they got together, and they hired people, and they moved this house to Greenwood, and now it's in a park. And uh, I really feel, I got a letter from the president of Moore House, and, and, and I just feel that, that, that ornament really sparked that interest, and I was so happy to do that. I also did the windows. These are the windows to Claflin's chapel. Our president, Dr. Tisdale, said he wanted windows. He said it's a chapel, but it's an interdenominational chapel, and we have students from 30 different countries, and so he wanted me to design something to express African and African-American art. So. I came up with this because I remember when he came to Claflin, he would say, every rung goes high and higher. That was his theme, and that was from Jacob's Ladder, and also African sculpture has this kind of feeling. So I simply put these together, and this is one window. We have seven windows in it, and the windows start dark at the back, and they get lighter as you go toward the front of the chapel. Uh, the same design repeated, but the colors are different. And what I did to do the rose window, I took the top of the windows and put them together. And this was donated by Dr. Tisdale. Dr. Tisdale is a very methodical man who's straight up. But he's got, his wife is, is someone who is very creative and splashy, and she likes to wear different clothes. So what I did was try to put her here and then put a symbol that kind of represents him there. I never told them this, so don't mention it. But, uh, and down around it is the kind of uh, kente cloth to, to, to create the African motif. But it's, um, that, that, that was done. Well, all of what I've just said is in a book that I did called Messages from Home that you'll find right over there. And the book won a national award. And it's the first publication of Clapham University Press. And I, I was so pleased by that because I worked on the book for four years. And when I do these lectures, everybody says, well, where can you, where can you um, uh, 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 get more? Where can I learn more? And I have to tell them online. Well, I did the book, and the book is going great. I'm going to be one of the presenting authors at the South Carolina Book Festival next month. Uh, USC has sold, the book is in its second printing. Uh, and uh, uh, USC Press has, I mean, over 100, has sold over 100 books. Uh, it's online on Amazon, but it's done exceptionally well. When I did the book, one of the things that I believe that books ought to be works of art. You don't book, book a book about art that is really not arty, I think. 
And so what I try to do is do something that is not like the electronic books where you push a button on the side of the page. I wanted you to have an experience of, 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 of turning the pages. I have dials where you look through a hole in one page and see another page. I have a pullout where you pull it out and it's 48 inches. And it was expensive to do that. But when you do a book about your work, after you're gone, the book is going to be there, and that's how people are going to find out what you're about. So I spent a lot of time doing this. It's gone over there, and it's, uh, it's discounted, and I hope you'll stop by and get a copy. I'll be over there to sign it. Thank you so much. <laughs>